What up, Rinku Army and MLW fans? Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Square Circle Podcast. I'm your host, Marie Shadows, and on this episode, I will be going over MLW Fusion Alpha that debuted on October 27th, 2021. Which, by the way, did you know that watching MOW can be for free over on the YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Major League Wrestling every single Wednesday at 7 p.m. And then my reviews should either come out later that day on Wednesday or the next day. The only reason why all three of these MOW Fusion Alpha review podcast episodes are dropping all at the same time is because i decided to take a little bit more of a mental health break and try to get my content in a new direction by reopening up a patreon maybe having only fans in the works and then having a discourse so we could create events and create a feel-good community where there is no toxicity no negativity and only positivity because we should be each other's biggest cheerleaders whenever we're making content Content can be so lonely half the time. So I rather it be a big gigantic party where all of us can be together. And also as a quick reminder, MOW is having a war chamber November 6th in Philadelphia at the 2300 arena. So make sure to get your tickets now. Usually I would go as press, but unfortunately due to traveling issues and financial issues, I will not be there. So I say good luck, be safe and have fun to the rest of my podcast peeps and all the reporters that are going to be there. Hopefully we could all be together in December when MOW W comes to New York City and we get to party like New Yorkers know how. I do want to thank all my listeners around the world for tuning in to an episode of the Square Circle podcast. It means a lot to me. It really does. Just make sure to keep sharing with your network and get the word out. The more listens, the better. The more views, the better. We'll definitely be taking over the algorithm. But other than that, let me jump into my review of MOW Fusion Alpha. MOW Fusion Alpha starts off with a video package of Cesar Duran in his office just thinking about things because he has that wonderful National Openweight Championship title on his desk, which was given up by Hammerstone as we saw a couple of Fusion Alpha episodes back. And so he's wondering what he should do with it. As in tradition, MOW will be airing on Thanksgiving, November 24th, which is a Wednesday. And you guys know you can head over to YouTube to watch it at 7 p.m. So on Thanksgiving, we will have a match to determine who's going to be the new national openweight champion. Then Cesar Duran gets a knock at the door and Kim Huertas comes walking in with that new Caribbean championship title on his shoulder. Duran congratulates him for winning that championship off of Richard Holiday, which, by the way, was a stupid way to take it off of him. Like, why do you need Contra members to attack him twice and then have Duran throw champagne in his face just so that way King Muertas can take the belt off of Richard Holiday? Could have King Muertas take the belt off of him by himself with no interference. Judging from what we saw last week, my answer is going to be no. However, back to this segment. King Wethers wants Caesar Duran to fulfill his end of the bargain. What bargain could this possibly be? Which I'm very intrigued and curious about. And so Duran reaches over to this box that has a mask that's protruding up from the cover and hands it to King Wethers. And when King Muertes opens this box, it glows, and that is it for that segment. So now I'm left with more questions than answer. What is in that box? Why is it glowing? What bargain did King Muertes make with Caesar Duran? MOW opened up the show with another Opera Cup match. This one is Lee Moriarty taking on Bobby Fish. 
Both of these athletes are signed to AEW, and it's kind of crazy to see them here in MOW. I was really enjoying Bobby Fish being at MOW. It was cool to see him live. I never got the chance to. But yes, once again, during the Opera Cup matches, I am there live, and I am covering the matches live while I'm there, and you see it. As you watch MOW every Wednesday at 7 p.m. over on the YouTube channel. So, yes, I was present for Lee Moriarty versus Bobby Fish. And this was one hell of a match to watch live. And so I'm a little like Bobby Fish should have waited until signing with AEW because he could have had like paid by appearance with MOW or, you know, whatever contract they would have gave him. So that way Bobby Fish can take away the WWE feel to him, the NXT feel to him, and Bobby Fish could become his own man in MOW for a little bit. He didn't have to stay there long, but I really would have loved to watch him grow further with MOW, have some fresh matchups. While, yes, Going over to AEW does grant you fresh matchups, but AEW's roster is so stacked. It is so bloated that you're going to get lost in the shuffle. And for someone of Bobby Fish's caliber, why would you want to get lost in the shuffle if you're not going to go after Adam Cole to try to settle some differences from a different company? Like, it did not make any sense to me why Bobby Fish were to automatically sign with AEW without wanting to without wanting to explore different options. Like, imagine if Bobby Fish was in New Japan Strong for like a little bit and he's facing guys like Carl Fredericks, Alex Coughlin, and then maybe following suit to go to Impact and fight like Josh Alexander or some other people, like people that are on his caliber. There's not many people that are on his caliber in AEW, even though there probably is. And I'm not really thinking about it, but I think Bobby Fish would have been a huge talk if he would have decided to maybe go to New Japan Pro Wrestling for a couple matches. Imagine if we ever got Bobby Fish versus Will Ospreay, Bobby Fish versus TJP, Bobby Fish versus Jeff Cobb. And Jay White and like some of the rest of the New Japan guys like I would have loved fresh matchups and not going to AEW because you think that's your first stop after getting let go by WWE you know what I'm gonna admit that too when I got let go by WWE and I knew that AEW was forming in 2019 I would have jumped shift and I would have went over to AEW and helped them out but I would have helped them out in a way where I am a writer for them I am a limited writer and all my responsibilities would be to get over the characters because some of these characters are not over and some of these people are not even playing characters and they rely too heavily on a hardcore fan base rather than trying to build an all around fan base to love what AEW does. And because I cover professional wrestling, I am no longer watching Dark, Elevation, rampage i'll tune in from time to time but like whatever twitter tells me about these things that's what i'm going off on because i already have too much on my plate but then again let's not get into too much of that because this podcast episode is not about that it's about mow and the opera cup opening the mow show it's just that I'm just trying to figure out why Bobby Fish would sign with AEW when there's already too much talent in AEW and he could have had different matches with different companies before settling down with AEW, you know? Now, with Lee Moriarty, he is definitely a young kid. He's definitely an entrepreneur. He has his own clothing line. He's doing a lot of things, and he's very successful at it. And he was successful being on the indies, doing this, doing that. And then finally, we see him on MOW, and that's very awesome. You're like, oh, great. He's getting the recognition he deserves. And then he signs a contract with AEW because of his great ability. And I totally get that. However... Lee Moriarty has yet to win a match on AEW while in MOW he'll still be featured and he'll still have matches 
MOW makes sure to books all the guys that they have and they don't have like a really large roster. So, you know, eventually you're going to get booked for something. Even if you don't win, at least you have some story build up. You have some character build up and people are just behind you. This crowd, when this match was happening, was definitely behind Lee Moriarty and they were definitely behind Bobby Fish. But then again, Lee Moriarty would still have been showed up to work. He still would have been on people's TVs, whether that's you watching YouTube, you watching the Fight TV app, or you watching over in the UK. AEW, he has yet to appear. Where is he? Why doesn't he not have any matches under his belt or at least any wins under his belt? And Bobby Fish has a lot more wins than Lee Moriarty. And they both got signed and they both came in relatively at the same time. I don't get it. This is why sometimes you don't want to automatically sign with AEW because they have such a large roster you're gonna get forgotten you're gonna get lost in the shuffle and that's why I like when guys decide to go to New Japan Pro Wrestling go to Impact Wrestling and you know do that instead because they have a lot more chances to get seen and talked about and then they could do it on their own we start off with chain wrestling. Lee Moriarty has control of the wrist. However, Bobby Fish takes Lee Moriarty down simply by just tripping him and then traps the legs into submission and instantly goes for a headlock to add more pressure to the overall move. Bobby Fish and Lee Moriarty start fighting on the apron. And as Fish is now on the outside, Lee Moriarty was going to go for a punk kick and the referee decides to stop Lee Moriarty. Why did that happen? Why did the referee interfere when it was an okay kick? It's not an illegal kick to go kick Bobby Fish on the outside. So this caused a distraction and Bobby Fish takes advantage of it by taking out the legs of Lee Moriarty and Lee hits his face on the apron. And then he lands to the outside and Fish uses the outside to his advantage and he throws Moriarty into the barricade and delivers some strikes to him. Fish rolls Mar Bobby Fish rolls Lee Moriarty back into the ring and does a slingshot sent on and the commentators sort of took me out of the match because while I'm hearing it back, I you know there was no commentary during the match but watching the match and the commentators mentioned how old Bobby Fish is Bobby Fish does not look like he's 45 well 46 now because his birthday just passed but Bobby Fish does not look like he's in his 40s he looks like he's probably starting his 40s or still in his late 30s that's how great of a condition this guy has been keeping himself and I'm just like yo that's not true aside from that little tidbit Lee Moriarty is getting in some offense, putting a sleeper onto Bobby Fish. However, Bobby Fish keeps breaking the sleeper, but Lee Moriarty is so determined and so ambitious and persistent to try again, and he does. However, there is an exploded suplex from Bobby Fish to Lee Moriarty, and that stops the sleeper. And Bobby Fish goes for a back suplex, and he covers Lee Moriarty, and Moriarty kicks out. Bobby Fish then goes into submission mode and does a heel hook to Lee Moriarty, applies a lot of pressure, and that is when Lee taps out. Lee Moriarty taps out to Bobby Fish. Bobby Fish is our winner, and he advances in the Opera Cup. And then we get two backstage segments. The first one is that... MLW reporters caught up with EJ Nanduka and asked him what it means to join Hammerstone's team. EJ basically says that joining Hammerstone's team is awesome. However, because Hammerstone has that belt, maybe after all of this, Hammerstone can grant him a shot at that championship title. After this back, after this backstage segment, another MLW reporter catches up with Calvin Tankman and asks his thoughts about Alex Kane and King Mo trying to recruit him to their team. And Calvin is honest. Calvin is like, does he really need them? He's been on a winning streak. He doesn't really need them. He's probably not going to join them. And then 
in comes Alex Kane and Keen Mo, and they hear this, and then they jump him, attack him, and even attack him with an electrical plug that splits him wide open. And they basically have Calvin Tankman go to the hospital, and Alex Kane is waiting to know if he's going to be replacing Calvin Tankman in this Opera Cup tournament. We don't know yet. We're going to find out soon. We also get another backstage segment with Mads Kruger going to Caesar Durant and Caesar Durant basically saying that Kruger is going to go back to his roots. I don't know what that means, but Kruger is definitely a big guy in MOW. And I really think that for someone to really bring the most out of Mads Kruger is going to have to be Braun Strowman. I will not say Braun Strowman's real name because it just doesn't fit. He honestly doesn't look like an Adam, but that's just me. But he needs Braun Strowman to bring out a really good side to Kruger because I just don't really care about the guy. And I'll tell you why when we get to his match. After that, we are greeted with an earlier today segment where another MOW news reporter goes up to Willow Nightingale and asks her about what she thought about Holly Dead attacking her. And as you can see in that video in the background, you can definitely see Ravage Dragon, who's wearing the Mets sweater and JD Alpha, who's in that like Hawaiian shirt, walk past like always. Anyway, so... Will Nightingale gives her thoughts and she really didn't like it. So she called up Caesar Duran and demanded a match with Holly Dead. So Willow Nightingale versus Holly Dead has been booked for MOW. And now we circle back to Mads Kruger. Mads Kruger has a match and it's against Dr. Dax. Dr. Dax is accompanied by Holly Dead to the ring. It is a short squash match. Nothing too exciting. Mads Kruger does a double underhook flapjack to Dr. Dax to pick up the victory. He covers him one, two, three. Again, Kruger is our winner for this match. And then Holly Dead attacks Dr. Dax for losing. And so... Kruger grabs the microphone and he talks about Hammerstone and he wants more competition and all that. And then Bud Heavy comes out. He's a fan favorite in Philadelphia and has a match with Kruger. He comes out with a chair trying to have the chair as an equalizer, but that doesn't work. Kruger gets the victory over Bud Heavy the same way he got the victory over Dr. Dax. And that's it. Kruger is still undefeated, as said by the commentators, but I honestly believe in order to make Kruger really good, you need Braun Strowman to go against them. I don't know any other big guy that could go against them right now, but Braun Strowman might be the only possible good thing to go against them. And now we come to the main event of MLW Fusion Alpha, which was an important main event, and it was one of my favorites to watch. Even I was watching it live. And it was an honor to watch Alex Shelley live and also to watch TJP live. Alex Shelley and TJP are very great athletes. And to have both of them in this match, they're both veterans. They both fought each other so many times over the years all around the world. And they still continue to impress. Even the little things are impressive. I usually pop for the little things because details matter in matches like this when you have two amazing competitors having a great ass match. So we automatically start off with some arm drags by Shelly to TJP. And they keep doing this series of arm drags and it's getting under TJP's skin. Alex Shelley just knows when to really use TJP's momentum against them and keeping him on his toes. However, you know TJP wants to take control of this match. But Alex Shelley is not letting him do that at this point. Alex Shelley then puts TJP into an abdominal stretch and then TJP gets out of that. There's another arm drag and wrist control. And Alex Shelley at this point is declining TJP of any type of offense until we get to a flying mare and a back elbow. And again, Alex Shelley is continuing to work on the arm of TJP. 
Alex Shelley is now on the outside. TJP does a cross body onto Alex Shelley, getting some momentum and getting some offense and, and trying to turn the match in his favor. He does a twisting head scissors and this amazing sharpshooter Muda lock with a bridge. And he bridges up a little bit higher than normal. So that way TJP can also grab Alex Shelley's face into a chin lock and just add more pressure into the middle of the back while he's doing this submission. TJP comes up with a very innovative offense whenever he's in the ring with amazing opponents, especially like someone of Alex Shelley, since Alex Shelley has been keeping him on his toes and working on that arm. TJP has responded to do submissions, no matter if his arm is hurt, to take control of the match. Shelly manages to get out of that submission and throws TJP face first into the turnbuckle and then does a runny knee and then a DDT. Goes for the cover. TJP kicks out. Alex Shelly now goes for a frog splash to TJP, does a quick cover. TJP kicks out of that. They <clears throat> they exchange shots at this point onto a super kick. Takes down TJP to one knee. Alex Shelley comes in to try to do slice bread. However, it is countered with a kick. As Alex Shelley is laying in the middle of the ring, TJP goes up to the top rope and does a frog splash and misses. And this is where Alex Shelley takes advantage and tries to do the border city stretch. TJP then manages to counter that into an STF submission on Alex Shelley, does a roll up and a cover. Alex Shelley kicks out and applies the Border City stretch once more. And TJP rolls Shelley over. And TJP and Alex Shelley are so close to the ropes that TJP holds on to the ropes. And the referee counts one, two, three. And TJP picks up the victory over Alex Shelley. By using the ropes. Maybe a technicality. We could also say that the strength and momentum and the weight kept Alex Shelley's shoulders down, but the camera was in such good position that TJP used the leverage of the ropes to include more weight so that way Alex Shelley does not get his shoulder up. Regardless of how you felt about the match, it was still an amazing match from start to finish. And I really do enjoy loving these two guys wrestle and tell stories. And this was a really great story. And it felt more like teacher versus student. And the student definitely won over Alex Shelley. And I know that TJP is such a really great veteran in this sport. But it still felt like teacher versus students. It felt like who can one up who. And Alex Shelley had the right game plan to work on the body part. But TJP is so clever and cunning and sly that he's able to do innovative offense to anybody. It does not even matter. And even if you do work on the body part of TJP, TJP is pulling something out of his sleeve in order to pick up a victory. Whether that means to hold the ropes, not hold the ropes, or just be innovative with his offense offense and get you off guard because you can't really study a guy like TJP. TJP has way too many variables for you to check off the list and know that you might have a game plan and that game plan may or may not work. TJP is that cunning and that sly. Alex Shelley is the same way. Alex Shelley is another great veteran in this business, and I love watching him live. I think the last time I ever watched him live was during Ring of Honor, and this was when he was facing Generation Me with his partner Chris Saban and his Zamoda City Machine Guns. And this was back in Ring of Honor when they came here to New York City at the Hammerstein Ballroom. So... You know, I've had a history of like following Alex Shelley's career and watching this match live was definitely an honor and truly an amazing moment. And to see TJP wrestle live as well, too, that was an amazing moment. But I still want to know why the TJP joined the United Empire, even though well, Osprey was talking shit about him in Resurgence. 
I understand that TJP turned on the Young Lions. I totally get it. I'm going to have to go back and watch and do some research and finally sit down to watch everything. But initially, if someone's talking shit about you, why would you join the team? Did he join because Will Ospreay gave him a chance, an opportunity at that IWGP World Heavyweight Championship title that Will Ospreay proclaims that it is his and he is the real IWGP World Heavyweight Championship while he's having the Osprey tour here in the United States for New Japan Pro Wrestling? Like, I want to know these things. Either way, I do like the working relationship that TJP has with MOW and the working relationship that MOW has with anybody that is willing to make some really good wrestling. So, ladies and gentlemen, do not forget that every single Wednesday you can watch MOW on YouTube at 7 p.m. and then hear my review either later that day or the next day, meaning Thursday. This has been my full review of MOW Fusion Alpha for 10 27 21. Coming up next on the MOW reviews and podcast episodes of the Square Circle Podcast, I would definitely be going over War Chamber and breaking down that match card. And it is going to be an amazing event. Unfortunately, I will not be there due to financial and traveling issues. But I really do hope that everyone has fun and they are safe and they have a great time. I will see MLW in New York City, so that'll be amazing. I love covering pro wrestling. I really do. This is not a gimmick, ladies and gentlemen. This is my passion. This is my life. And this is way better than having a nine to five job. So if you believe that I deserve your support in terms of financial wise, you guys can definitely support me over at patreon.com forward slash Marie Shadows. Patreon has definitely been redone. What you can find on the new Patreon is that there are access to Discord roles. If you sign up to any of the tiers, you will get a Discord role called Patreon. You'll be able to participate in the events and also stage channels where we talk about wrestling, hobby, life. It is a safe environment so that way you can say what you need to say, no judgment, and we're there to support each other and to cheer each other on to achieve all of our goals. And I'm just making a safe community. So if you want any part of that, head over to patreon.com forward slash Marie Shadows. If you want to listen to this podcast episode in audio format, anchor.fm forward slash square circle podcast is the place to go. If you want to support me there, they have an option to give a tip. You are not obligated to, but it is encouraged and you can give as much as you want, as little as you want. Anything helps this channel. Anything helps me to get better equipment and to travel to places so that way I can cover professional wrestling for you, even though we are doing it together because together we make wrestling memories. If you want the video version of this, it is going to be over at youtube.com forward slash square circle podcast. If you want to follow me on Twitter at Marie underscore shadows is the place to follow me. And then if you go to the profile, click that subscribe button to be subscribed to the newsletter to get a roundup of all the wrestling content that I do and including my peers. So Patreon, Discord, Anchor, YouTube newsletter, all that would be in the description And I hope to see you in the Discord so we can have fun chatting about wrestling. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to an episode of the Square Circle Podcast. I am your host, Marie Shadows, and I'll see you guys on the next one.